My name is Joel Tickner. I direct the Green Chemistry and Commerce Council, which is a, an initiative of the Lowell Center for Sustainable Production at the University of Massachusetts at Lowell. I'd like to welcome you to today's uh, webinar of the GC3 Green Chemistry Ed Education webinar series entitled Toxicology and Why You Should Care. As background for the Green Chemistry and Commerce Council, it's a business-to-business -business forum that advances the application of green chemistry across supply chains. Uh, it is an effort to provide for cross-sectoral collaborations to share information and experiences about the challenges to and, and opportunities to advance safer chemicals and products. Our vision of the GC3 is that green chemistry and green engineering are standard practices throughout the economy contributing to innovation, improved public health, and protection of the environment. On today's webinar, we'll be discussing one of the foundations of green chemistry, which is how we think about the health implications or the toxicity of chemicals and design out that toxicity in the first place. Um, for our webinar, I'm going to introduce Saskia Van Bergen, who is the Green Chemistry Coordinator of the Washington Department of Ecology, and she'll be facilitating today's webinar. Welcome, Saskia, and thank you for putting together today's webinar. Thank you, Joel. Uh, this is the second webinar um, for the GC3 education series, Toxicology and Why You Should Care. We have three great speakers that I'd like to introduce. The first one is Stephen Gilbert, who is the director of the Institute of Neurotoxicology and Neurological Disorders, an affiliate professor for the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences at the University of Washington. The second speaker is Calbear Anderson, who's a toxicologist at the US EPA Design for the Environment branch, where she conducts hazard and alternative assessments to identify safer chemicals to promote informed substitutions. And finally, we have Rob Roy, who's a lead toxicology specialist in the 3M Medical Department, where he provides toxicology support to the 3M Consumer Healthcare and Skin and Wound Care Divisions. For housekeeping, um, we will have each of the speakers give a presentation, and then we'll have a panel discussion. And due to the number of participants, all lines will be muted. If you wish to ask a question or make a comment, please type your question in the question and answer box located in the drop-down control panel at the top of your screen. And all questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. So with that, let me introduce Stephen Gilbert, who will be providing an introduction to toxicology. Stephen? Toxicology, that has to be a very quick introduction to toxicology. And I decided to use examples of different compounds to emphasize uh, properties of toxic chemicals or any chemical you want to be thinking about as you go along here. Try to change the slide here. Next slide. There we go. So the next slide, just a quick introduction here. I have a book called The Small Dose of Toxicology. It's a free ebook. It has many of the principles that we'll talk about today. You can download that from a small dose of that ORG. In addition, each chapter of the book has PowerPoint slides, so you can use them as a teaching aid. Next slide. So the other thing was it was just published in Chinese, in case any of you are interested in or understand Chinese, you can uh, purchase that book through the websites that were there. We move the next slide, please. There we go. Chinese small dose of that ORG. And just thinking about that, I saw in the paper the last couple of days, there's a really interesting article about pollutants that blow from China over to West Coast of the United States. So toxicology is a global issue. I have a lot of respect for trying to move toward more of a green chemistry. And this brings us into West Coast issues of coal, the issue of coal to China, when we get the pollution from China. And next slide, there we go. Next slide is milestones of toxicology. Uh, one of our efforts is to make it toxicological information fun and interesting. So this is a history of toxicology, and you can open up, up the PDF file and click on any of those squares to get more information, just to give you an introduction. Because our goal is to make toxicological information to put it in context of history, society, and culture. Next slide, here we go. And that's Toxopedia, our website that we run all this information through. It has information about risk assessment and a lot of chemicals as well as history. Next one there. And I think inheriting the future, you know, why we should care. That's my granddaughter. And I, on the left side, just a few issues that might be concerned about from global warming to burning coal, coal waste, talked a little bit about that. 
mercury I'll talk a little bit more about once in our fish. We're contaminating a really important food source, nuclear waste, chemical body burden, which is a big issue, and chemical use and sustainability, because really got the thinking of the future here. And a lot of my work is on child health-related issues, and the little guy on the right there will never make a big intellectual contribution to a society, and he's really dismantling products that we ship over to the developing countries. I think we really need to take more responsibility for the products we're manufacturing and do it in a better, more sustainable way and dismantle these products appropriately. And this is the issue. The issue is we have millions of pounds of compounds, you know, 3,000 compounds that are produced a million pounds per year. And how do we, what day do we know about these? What information do we know? This was really well demonstrated recently in West Virginia where they that, um, leaked from that chemical storage facility. We didn't know a lot about that chemical and potential hazards to that chemical. So this is a really important issue. What do we know? And this comes back to Tosca and understanding our chemical policy. A really important thing is to rewriting Tosca. And this is the consequences. We have a lot of kids that have learning developmental disorders. But you can think about other issues such as cancer and neuro neurodegenerative disorders that come on later in life. So huge consequences of what we're exposed to and how we deal with these chemicals. So a quick definition of toxicology, the study of poisons or adverse effects of chemicals and physical agents on living organisms. This is a very broad definition, but it's really the underlying principles that are important about this. As we start up, I want to just mention the uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, coming up with the definition of human environmental health. I think it's very important we all have one of those. I use the, I use the uh, definition conditions that ensure that all living things have the best opportunity to reach, maintain their full genetic potential. So when we expose kids, for example, to PCBs or lead or mercury or alcohol, we're really robbing them of their potential. And we have to be thinking this for the future. We can also apply this to animals when we cloud the rivers, block salmon from moving upstream, we're really robbing animals from their potential also. And to help in the decision-making process is a precautionary principle. I just want to mention this right up front. This is when activity raises threats of harm to human health and the environment. Precautionary measures should be taken even if some cause and effect relationship are not fully established scientifically. So even if there's some uncertainty, we need to make decisions about this. And this was really demonstrated in the last couple of days where the Surgeon General released a new report about uh, uh, tobacco and the consequences of smoking and really reemphasized it the consequences, the health consequences throughout many of our body organs. And all the, this battle was fought out for a long time, but we need to approach it from a precautionary perspective. We do that with Food and Drug Administration. When new drugs that go on the market, we have to have uh, lots of information about the efficacy and safety of a product before it's put on the market. We do not have, a, have that approach when it comes to industrial chemicals. For example, many of us excrete BPA in our urine and I bet nobody was given permission to expose the BPA. And next slide, please. And this, anybody know what compound this is? This is a really important compound. It demonstrates many of the principles of toxicology. I'll bet some of you have this sitting on your desk right now, and yes, you guessed it, it's caffeine, 137-trimethylxanthine. And this is an important compound. It's the most widely consumed stimulant in the world. It's got some really interesting properties that make it very desirable compound, and, and the coffee and coal companies make a fortune off its principles. So what are they? Well, first, how many of you have felt the toxic side effects of caffeine from drinking too much of it? I bet many of you have. It means you can only drink so much caffeine at any one time. You can also, uh-oh. You can also um, be concerned about if you drink it and then you stop drinking, you get a headache. So what are the consequences of that? What's the half-life of caffeine? How, how long before you go for that second cup of coffee? It's usually about three or four hours. So it's a short half-life. And it distributes throughout total body water. So your urine will have about the same concentration of caffeine in your blood. So one of the principles of toxicology is think about where a compound distributes. Caffeine is not bioaccumulated. It's readily metabolized. So these are the properties, principles that make it very desirable. So you've got a short half-life, 
You can't drink it too much any one time. If you stop drinking it, you get headaches. The coffee and cola come. Love these principles. In addition, there's some other interesting things about it. If you're pregnant, your half-life increases about doubles. And that's because the body moves to maintain the placenta. So liver metabolism slows down. So you consume caffeine, your blood caffeine levels stay higher for a longer period of time. In addition, if you're an infant, you don't metabolize caffeine to about six months of age. So it takes a little bit of time for your liver to catch up with itself and your, your half-life is measured like in days. So it's very important for your breastfeeding to consume caffeine after breastfeeding, not before. So this demonstrates another fairly important principle of individual sensitivity. Next slide, please. And these are the basic principles of toxicology is dose response. What's the dose and what's the response? We sort of demonstrated that with caffeine. All of us sort of manage our dose response with caffeine. Risk is hazard times exposure. What's the risk of those neurotoxic effects of caffeine? You moderate the ex exposure. You consider the hazard. And you also have to take account individual sensitivity. Next slide, please. I just want to mention thalidomide. I think many of us are probably aware of thalidomide. It causes birth defects. But this is important to bring up because it really changed our management of chemicals. Because in this period, we realized that we need to do better testing of drugs that are put out on the market, and this really changed the rules and regulation for putting your drugs in the market. As I mentioned before, we do not have a similar situation with industrial chemicals that go on the market. This is um, alcohol, another really important compound, and uh, it has wide consumption throughout society. Next slide. And this is uh, at the top shows a, sl a slide of an infant that was exposed to alcohol in utero and an infant that died below in a car accident about the same period of time. So you can really see the massive in consequences of alcohol consumption for the developing fetus. Next slide. And this, uh, this shows uh, birth defects and facial deformities of an infant that was exposed to alcohol. And I bring this up because I really want to emphasize the individual sensitivity. You know, the mother can consume the alcohol without a lot of consequences, where it's very detrimental to the infant. And the other consequence is how much is too much of alcohol. I'd recommend not consuming alcohol during pregnancy. And I think that's pretty common advice anymore. But it really is, what are the lowest level effects of alcohol during pregnancy? This is more high level exposure to alcohol. Next slide, please. And the lead, we'll spend a couple minutes on lead, which I think is really important and demonstrates some different principles of toxicology. Next slide. This is a child in front of a cabinet had lead on it, and you can see the hand to mouth behavior. Lead substitutes for calcium, so it distributes throughout the body and distributes the bone. So if you consume alcohol, or sorry, when you're exposed to lead during development, that lead can also go to the bones as well as the nervous system. And even at very low levels, cause harm to the developing nervous system. And hand to mouth behavior is really important. So, the highest lead concentration is usually in one to three years of age. Half life of lead is about 30 days. So, you can be moved out of the environment, your blood leads drop. Next slide, please. And we knew a long time ago that lead makes the mind give way. Very important lesson. Next slide. This shows another recycling of lead materials. We talked a little bit about this. But it really is the developmental effects of lead that are so important. Next slide. And this is, um, I spent a little more time on this slide. The accepted childhood blood lead levels, you can see how they dropped from 60 down to 2012 when the CDC recently lowered it to five micrograms per deciliter. So it gradually dropped down as we understood the health effects of lead. I wrote a paper in 2006 arguing it should be at two. But the average blood lead right now across the United States is below two. So any child that's exposed to lead has a blood lead above two micrograms per deciliter. There are also health effects. And there's good data to show that even at two, there are adverse consequences of development and learning. So the interesting thing is here, usually when we think of toxicology, we build in safety factors. There's no built-in safety factor when it comes to lead exposure. So this is really important to be thinking about that in the long run. How do we manage our lead exposure? And lead was in paint. And just as a note, paint was, lead and paint was outlawed in Europe in the 20s by the League of Nations, the United States, not until 1978. So Europe took a very precautionary approach to lead. 
Uh, this is a guy sitting on mercury, and it's uh, mercury is a really interesting compound, still widely distributed in the environment. Next slide, please. And this is the uh, beginning of a really understanding that you cannot, the solution to pollution is not dilution. This shows Minamata Bay and the dumping of mercury into the bay. And this is where Minamata disease came from, where we understood that mercury is converted to methylmercury in the water and comes back in fish that we consume. Next slide. This little cartoon of that, really emphasizing that the mercury that comes out of the products we use or gets into the environment is turned into methylmercury. You see down at the bottom of the slide, HG into methyl HG, where it's taken up by algae and invertebrates, gradually moves up the food chain, so we end up contaminating a really important source of food. Now, in the background, you see a coal-fired utility plant and coal has mercury in it. When you burn coal, you release mercury. We know how not to do this, but we don't take a very precautionary approach. We've struggled with getting the coal plants put on pollution control devices to stop the mercury from the coal plants and the coal, the owners of these plants don't make any money from putting pollution control devices on. They want to put more boilers in there and generate more electricity. So it's a very tough issue in our society to get people to not externalize the cost. Otherwise, we externalize the cost on women and children of childbearing age. This is one of the problems shipping coal to China and the lack of pollution control devices on Chinese coal power utility plants. That mercury goes into the Pacific Ocean, contaminates fish as well as blowing into the West Coast. So it really does emphasize we need to be thinking holistically and globally about issues of toxicology. So mercury demonstrates the importance of being bioaccumulative and persistent in the environment and toxic all at the same time. So those are three things you really need to be thinking about. Is it chemical? But does it bioaccumulate? Is it persistent in the environment? And what are its toxicological properties? Next slide, please. And this is a consequence of that. Again, high level of mercury exposure. The real issue is what's the low level effects of methylmercury. And this has been worked on in many, many studies. And there's good arguments right now that uh, RFD, the reference dose the DPA has said needs to be lowered, as well as concentration of mercury in fish. Next slide, please. This is just one of the last examples of bromine flame retardant. You can see the bromine groups in that. It looks a lot like PCBs. Next slide, please. And this shows um, distribution of bromine flame retardants in house stuff. It's very interesting. It's not a really solid scientific study, but it does give you a flavor of the issues, how the flame retardants are distributed in the environment in people's homes, in the dust in people's homes, and who is exposed to dust, hand and mouth behavior of kids. So kids pick it up. This also shows up. Next slide. It uh, shows up in breast milk, human breast milk, as part of this study. And this is where the problem really initiated. They sh these compounds started showing up in human breast milk while they're testing for PCBs. So again, it's back to comp is the compound biocumulative, is a persistent environment, and now bromine flame retardants are distributed around the world and showing up in the Arctic and other mammals. Next slide, please. And just to wrap up here, susceptibility and variability, you've got to be thinking about who's susceptible. And it's very important to consider susceptibility when it comes to toxicology. Is it is a fetus susceptible? Is a male or female susceptible? Do we have individual variability? A lot of work goes into that, genetic variability, genetic differences, and there's also, of course, species difference in thinking of ecological and wildlife issues. Next slide. And just to sort of wrap up here with the cautionary principle, how do we think about this? What kind of values do we have? How do we go about making decisions about the compounds? And where do we put the emphasis? And not externalize the risk onto another population. Next slide. And this is some of the central principles of precautionary principle, taking preventive action in the face of uncertainty, shifting the burden of proof responsibility to opponents of activity. For example, I did research on lead for many, many years, and it was really where was the burden of responsibility? Why was the industry funding that work and also taking responsibility to demonstrate the safety of lead? Explore why we alternatives. Do we really need to use a chemical or can we do something differently? And increasing public participation decision making, which I think is vital. That's a lot of what we work on. Next slide, please. And I think that children have a right to a safe, fair, and healthy environment. I think you can broaden that. I think we all have that kind of right. And we have ethical responsibility to share and use the knowledge we have, which I think many of you are doing, which is really great. And we have a duty to promote health and well-being, particularly of children and the future generations. 
we all need to be thoughtful public health advocates. Next slide. And I think we all have to be thinking of the potential of children, we guard the potential of children with uh, better information and good decision making. We're really protecting the future. Next slide. And that's pretty much it. And I think we'll, I don't know where we're taking questions now or at the end of the talk in the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Steve. Next we have Cal Bear Anderson, who'll be talking about DFE methods for hazard evaluation. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm happy to be here to talk a little bit about um, DFE methods and approaches to evaluating chemical hazard uh, within the framework of alternatives assessment. All right. Um, okay, so in this talk, which should be pretty brief, I'll give you a, a background on design for the environment, DFE, where I work. We'll talk a little bit about um, what is safer from the DFE point of view and, and how we um, evaluate uh, chemical hazard, hazards and safety using DFE criteria, and I'll end up with a couple examples. All right, so Design for the Environment is a non-regulatory program. So we are, um, uh, our goal is to incentivize the development of safer products by identifying and selecting safer chemical ingredients. So we're housed within the Office of, um, of uh, uh, Pollution Prevention and Toxics, OPPT, so our focus really is on on the chemistry and toxicology of the chemicals in commerce. We do consider life uh, cycle impacts, but in a much less formalized way than, than say, uh, life cycle assessment. The tools that we use were developed to inform the EPA new chemicals program, which uh, is um, tasked with evaluating chemicals as they come on the market. Uh, as, as Stephen Gilbert mentioned, under the Toxic Substances Control Act, uh, we often don't have a lot of data to work with, so the technical tools and expertise are really focused on making decisions in a data-poor environment using whatever information we have in front of us, everything from chemical structure to uh, laboratory data um, and computer models. Because of our program is non-regulatory, uh, we take a multi-stakeholder approach. We um, seek out stakeholders who are interested in the chemicals that we're, that we're working on. That helps provide us with, with information on how chemicals are used, how chemicals may be substituted, what the challenges are to uh, chemical substitution, et cetera. We have two main programs within Design for the Environment, the Safer Product Labeling Program and the Alternatives Assessment Program. I'll be focusing on the Alternatives Assessment Program today. So with, because we're um, within the Office of Chemical Safety, our focus is on chemical alternatives assessment. So the, the purpose is to identify and evaluate potentially safer alternatives. And we do this, um, as we do this, we involve stakeholders from across the spectrum of interested parties, from um, industrial users of chem chemicals, makers of chemicals, um, environmental nonprofits, public health organizations, um, other uh, federal, state, and local agencies, et cetera. So that for the outcome of the alternatives assessment, we aim to provide the best information on chemical hazard from literature and models, structure activity relationships, as I noted, based on new chemicals program approaches. And it is our hope that these reports help stakeholders choose safer alternatives when they're available, um, but also to minimize the potential for unintended consequences. Often chemical alternatives are limited and they may have important trade-offs. So it's really important to understand if you're moving from one chemical to another, what those trade-offs may be 
so that you could take appropriate risk mitigation activities. Our approach is also rooted in green chemistry. Um, here on the, on the screen, of course, are the 12 principles of green chemistry, and I've highlighted several that link directly to this concept of reducing hazard. So we very much take our inspiration from uh, the principles of green chemistry. So as I mentioned, what we're looking for are chemical alternatives that may be safer than than chemicals that are currently in use. So this is this is an important concept to understand by what we what we mean by safer. Risk is a function of hazard and exposure. So safer is roughly equivalent to less risk. So the conventional approach to risk reduction or risk management has been to control exposure. And that is a valid approach to risk reduction. But exposure controls can and do fail. So what we are doing in design for the environment are looking for inherently less hazardous chemical substitutes so that we would control the, the risk equation uh, by reducing hazard instead of solely by controlling exposure. So this is predicated on understanding the relative continuation, sorry, continuum of hazard, which is illustrated at the bottom of the slide. So some chemicals are higher hazard or more potent than, than chemicals, some chemicals are lower hazard or less potent. So this is what we're looking for when we search for alternatives. And of course, we need to also consider other factors that may alter the risk equation. So if you have a tenfold decrease in hazard, but a 20-fold increase in the amount that you need to use to get the same functionality, of course, you know, you're not really gaining anything um, in the risk reduction department. So it's tricky, it's not easy to do, but I think it's an important question that, that merits um, um, looking at. Another concept uh, that's important in design for the environment is that of functional use. So the functionality of a chemical is the job it does in the product. So it may be a surfactant or solvent or chelating agent. And functionality is also related to structure and physical chemical properties. So that you were, the goal is to make sure we understand functionality and functional use so that we're comparing apples to apples. So you don't want to, you, you can't substitute a surfactant with a solvent. You have to look at other surfactants. And there may indeed be uh, functional subclasses within these categories that, that we need to be mindful of. And that's part of the value of bringing stakeholders into this problem-solving exercise that we call alternatives assessments so that you get that information that certain, for example, certain solvents may not be adequately functional in a certain type of pro uh, product. So uh, we need that information from stakeholders so that we can help find um, a meaningful solution. When we characterize hazard, we look at a wide variety of, of um, hazard endpoints, including human health toxicity, and you can see the long list beneath that, uh, environmental state and effects, and that's mostly focused on aquatic toxicity as well as persistence and bioaccumulation. Additional endpoints can be brought into the evaluation, providing that they're relevant, um, such as physical hazards uh, like flammability, for example, or ecotoxicity. But uh, we're often, particularly when it comes to other uh, wildlife, um, we're, we're hampered by a lack of data that we can use to compare the different chemicals and certainly a lack of models that we can use to estimate toxicity in the absence of data. So these are, these are grave challenges that we face. Um, when, when we have limited information. The criteria that we use, for the most part, are threshold-based. So we're looking at the potency of the chemical. So 
uh, a very potent chemical will be biologically active at a very low level. And so that translates to high concern, high hazard concern based on our criteria. Whereas a very uh, low potent, less, a much less potent chemical might require an awful lot of very high level exposure to their biological activity. And so we would classify that as low or very low concern. We also take into account the route of exposure as well as a lot of other factors when we're evaluating data and assigning uh, the level of hazard concern, high, moderate, low, or very low. We also use what we refer to as evidence-based criteria, and that's based on the strength of evidence li linking a chemical to an effect. For example, a uh, known human carcinogen, a suspected mutagen. So, so depending on how much data you have, um, you can assign a high, moderate, or low concern um, when you're assessing a chemical under this type of criteria. Uh, the evidence-based criteria is also useful when you have no data, but you might have, you might know a chemical falls within a chemical class that's associated with known toxicity. And so then you can use that as, as um, you're bringing whatever information you have to the table to assign a level of concern. Okay, so, um, I, I think it's also, th th this gets more technical, but we do consider the chemical properties when we're evaluating a chemical um, in concert with the data that, that we may have or the computer models that we've used to evaluate it. So this is a, a summary of um, chemical property information that, that we use uh, in our alternative assessments, such as uh, the chemical structure, the physical form, it's its use, whether it's polymeric or not, whether metabolites, degradates, or trans transformation products can be identified, um, whether there are structural alerts, that is, you know, a, a part of that structure that's associated with, um, with specific toxicity, um, and other things like whether there are available risk assessments or uh, evaluations by authoritative bodies that have assigned risk phrases, for example. So we really try to take um, a holistic look at the chemical that we're evaluating. We then provide three levels of information to stakeholders. So on this page, this illustrates two levels of information. So on the, uh, we, we provide a summary of the available data including the reference and some notes about data adequacy. In the purple, we provide a uh, summary statement that captures our assessment of that level of hazard concern based on the, the available data models, analogs, et cetera. And then on the next page, the third level is um, is kind of like the highest level. It provides an overview of the levels of hazard concern that we've assigned for each endpoint, for each chemical in a comparative table. So this allows you to rapidly assess, you know, how did the chemicals compare? And then you can go back to the document to get all the details on how that level of hazard uh, concern was assigned. So, uh, well, one more thing. I, I, you know, um, the folks who are most interested in the science are very uncomfortable with these these um, simplified uh, ways of communicating hazard with low, moderate, high in a table. They much prefer the more detailed descriptions that we also provide. But what we've also found is that some stakeholders, um, this, this level of information is too much, too detailed, and uh, they're, they're um, less interested in this part. So by providing three levels of information, we hope to reach most of the stakeholders out there and provide them something that, that they can take, um, take home to think about. 
Um, as you know, I'm sure there's a growing community of practice and uh, folks are using methods that are uh, related to uh, the DFE approach of evaluating hazard, including uh, states and NGOs and, and a variety of co um, companies and trade associations. So the methods that they use may not be identical, but it's along similar lines, this concept that hazard exists on a continuum and what we're looking for are functional chemicals on the, uh, the low hazard end of that continuum. And with that, I'll um, just point out that there are several links here to our homepage, our alternatives assessment pages, um, and you can also download uh, a copy of our alternative, alternatives assessment criteria. And here's my contact information, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Cal. Our final presenter is Rob Roy. He'll be talking about his work at 3M. Rob? Uh, good day, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm happy to talk about toxicology and uh, what we do here at 3M. Um, a lot of this will um, sound very similar to what Cal presented. She just gave an excellent introduction to what we do at 3M. So with that, I will just get, uh, get going here. What I'm going to talk about is the role of uh, toxicology here at 3M and alternatives assessment. And uh, this first quote you may be familiar with, um, the identifying, comparing potential and non, uh, chemical and non-chemical alternatives. And the goal is to reduce risk by reducing hazard. And I have the obligatory risk is um, equal to hazard times exposure. It's really a function, but it's a very, very useful equation. So what we're trying to do with alternatives assessment and toxicology at 3M is look at that hazard portion. As Kel mentioned, we often deal with the exposure part by um, the number one is uh, by using personal protective equipment or um, other industrial hygiene controls like ventilation and things like that. But in this talk, we're being talking about how can we alter that um, hazard portion of the risk equation. And again, as she mentioned, um, safety is the inverse of risk. So you, if you have high risk, you have low safety and vice versa. Um, for alternative assessment, our roles and responsibility as a toxicologist, I've been doing this at 3M for a lot of years. And um, um, our responsibility is to carry out document and communicate the chemical health hazard assessment. Um, I'm going to talk about um, health rather than environmental and other assessments today. And we also always consider attributes beyond hazard and especially risk. And we use that previous equation, risk as a function of hazard and exposure. Um, as far as choosing what are the alternatives, generally we have a little input into that at 3M, but mostly we leave it up to the product developers and the chemists and everything who know millions of times more about these, um, in, these ingredients as far as their functionality and different products. And so oftentimes we'll be uh, in a position that they'll say, well, we have these three alternatives. Can you give us your opinion regarding the, the hazard and you know, ultimately the risk too? So that's where we start off. Um, this is this is probably very familiar to a lot of the attendees today, but we as toxicologists need to ensure that the chemical alternatives is an improvement, and we can look at improvement in a lot of different ways. But we can't simply move away from a chemical of concern. We need to have a better option. And things that we need to consider, um, uh, especially hazard, we need to balance multiple health endpoints. And if you go back, Cal had a very nice slide, slide number 13 in her presentation, that looks at the different, you need to balance, you, you get rid of one health hazard maybe or reduce that health hazard, but add another one or add two others by, um, by substitution of chemicals and using alternatives. So we have to be very, very careful about that. Again, we have to make sure that chemical still works and we hope it still works in the same quantity as the chemical we are substituting, but uh, sometimes it doesn't. And of course, cost is always a, fac uh, a factor in um, alternatives. You may have an alternative, but it's very, very cost prohibitive. Um, and you know, just to put it very simply, we need to avoid regrettable chemical substitutions and we have to balance this very, very uh, efficiently and with a lot of thought. 3M um, has had a long history preparing comprehensive, toxicologically defensible, and transparent chemical health hazard assessments, both internally and externally. And these not only include health, but physical and environmental assessments. I'm involved with health hazard assessments, so that's what I'm going to be focusing on today. 
And here we use um, health, health hazard assessments for a lot of different purposes, and these are just some examples for hazard communication, you know, MSDS as we call them now, SDSs and labels, and especially worker training, very, very important when we talk about hazard and alternatives and, and things like that. And of course, risk and safety assessment preparation. And last but not least in the example is helping through to make informed decisions uh, regarding chemical use. This is our alternative assessment and, and getting towards that less hazardous and being able to say this is a safer safer chemical in the, um, the scenario risk and is a function of hazard and exposure. Um, we provide comprehensive evaluation of available scientific evidence in chemical hazard assessments and in order to determine its human health uh, effects. And we designate those as health hazard endpoints. Uh, very, very important considerations that we are always thinking about as toxicologists is um, we need to access and interpret all the available data. Uh, important considerations for uh, doing a chemical health hazard assessment. The data need to be scientifically validated. If they're not, can we validate them? This goes really into the reliability of the data. And many of you are probably familiar with the Klimisch scores and the references given there if you want the paper. It's Regulatory Toxin Pharmacology. From 1997, you get Klimisch scores. And usually Klimisch scores of one or two are um, very reliable in, in instances. We look at statistical significance of the results. Are the results that we're looking at biologically plausible? Maybe in, you know, they may be in, a, in experimental animals, but in humans. Uh, very, very key, and I'm going to talk about this in the next couple of slides, is determ determination of an adverse health effect versus one that's not adverse. We want to do our health hazard assessment based on adverse endpoints, and it may sound very easy to say, oh, that's an adverse effect and that's not, but in practice, in a lot of instances, that's not a very easy decision to make. And we also use a weight of evidence evaluation. Uh, weight of evidence is evaluation of all positive, negative, and equivocal data. Cal mentioned strength of evidence when you look at only the positive data that go towards that endpoint. Um, these are two definitions of adverse um, effect. Um, the first definition is used by OECD and the REACH regulation in the European Union, and the second is the World Health Organization through the International Program of Chemical Safety. And you can see it's a change in morphology, physiology, growth, uh, impairment of functional capacity, and so on. They're very um, amorphous kind of definitions, and they can often be in the eye of the beholder at a certain level. So that's what we try to, one of the major focuses that in toxicology and hazard identification, hazard evaluation, is determining if that effect that we're looking at, that endpoint we're looking at, is it an adverse health effect. You can have, um, you know, we look for the no adverse adverse effect level and so on. So, but the determination of adverse versus non-adverse is absolutely critical because we want to do a health hazard evaluation on adverse health effects. And so the critical, as I mentioned, it's critical to look at adverse versus non-adverse. Sometimes people will say non-adverse are um, adaptive effects, and I don't want to get into that in any great deal, but I give you some guidance resources that you may be interested in. And again, this, this can also use um, a lot of professional judgment and experience to determine adverse from non-adverse. And some of the guidance resources, again, this is not an extensive list, but these are some that we use in 3M uh, that give us some guidance on, you know, if we're looking at a, you know, a change in, you know, liver function or something or change in liver enzymes and things like that, is this an adverse health effect or it's not? And um, the GHS, Chapter 3, um, those two sections, um, the SCTOC European um, Center for Ecotoxicology, Toxicology of Chemicals, their technical report number 85, and a journal article from Toxicologic Pathology from 2002. Uh, the, these are, the last one is um, mainly on liver uh, effects, and EPA also has some guidance on um, liver effects too, which are very, very critical. But I can't stress enough the absolute importance of uh, that determination of adverse versus ad non-adverse in your um, hazard identification, health hazard identification. The general process that we use at 3M and a lot of companies use throughout, um, globally actually, is, you know, I will go through that in the next few slides. The first is we gather available health hazard data on the chemical. And here at 3M, we use what we call the tiered literature search strategy, and it's CAS number specific for a lot of, for vast majority of the chemicals we deal with. 
and we do tier one, and these are just some examples. Uh, we use 3M data in comprehensive, peer-reviewed, regular, regularly updated, authoritative, reliable, easily accessed secondary resource and classifications. Some of these are um, uh, sources that you need to pay for and others are not. Uh, the aerial website can give you uh, GHS classifications and a wealth of data on classifications of chemicals throughout uh, the world. The European Chemicals Agency REACH Registration Database, if you're not familiar with that, it is an absolute gold mine of data. Uh, but sometimes you will have to actually look at that data and make your own, um, your, your, your own um, endpoint assumptions from the data. Uh, you may or may not agree with the, uh, the registrant. Uh, the agents, ATSDR tox profiles, EPA IRIS, European Union Risk Assessment Reports, International Program of Chemical Safety, and documentation of occupational exposure limits, um, Terra or the wheels, workplace environmental exposure levels, and uh, the ACGH TLVs provide a wealth of documentation on chemicals. Uh, our tiered literature search strategy goes to tier two. Um, and we have other secondary sources, and some examples are Euclid data sheets, IARC monographs, the Prop 65 list and documentation of um, why it's on that list, and other lists that you may find, national toxicology program study reports, abstracts, et cetera, and OECD SIDS documentation. These are all readily available um, through the, uh, the parent organization and on the website and through uh, purchased uh, databases. And finally, we have Tier 3, and in Tier 3, we have factual and bibliographic databases, including the primary literature. And these are examples of the National Library of Medicine ToxNet, uh, their PubMed, and Scopus. I don't know what that stands for, but that's a, a database that we have at 3M that provides searching. A wealth of data can be had by from the TOSCA test submission. Sometimes those are called TOSCATs, T-S-C-A-T-S. And these are TOSCA 80 submissions. And again, these are a wealth of um, information. These are not peer reviewed. These are study reports, et cetera, that are submitted by companies uh, for 80 submissions. But again, it's a wealth of data, just like that ECHA database. And vendor raw material safety data sheets, technical data sheets. And last but not least, we also use internet searching, but please be careful. And I don't have to say you know, too much about that as far as you know, the quality and reliability of the data, but um, I think when you see that, you know, if it comes from a reliable company that, uh, you know, this may be very, very useful. Um, and the asterisk means that um, we search tier three for significant new information and to fill in data gaps because, you know, updating happens, but it doesn't happen, you know, immediately versus a new published paper comes out or so on that, that we could use. So the bottom line here is the absolute importance of accessing and, and interpreting and evaluating the available health hazard data for the chemical or chemicals that you are trying to do an alternative assessment on. Yeah, I can't over over stress that that key, and that's that's the key. And the better this step is, the better your alternative assessment is going to be. Then we conduct our comprehensive review of the assembled data, and we look at you know the hierarchy. Essentially, we look at the data for the chemical in question. Uh, we look if we don't have much of that, we look at data on the analog and single chemical class or a group, and I will. Um, I think you can still read that. And then data from models. Um, I want to stress that all adverse health effect endpoints are considered based on our definition and our, our criteria for what an adverse health effect is. And um, it, it shows over there that the slide got kind of goofed up, but in practical reality, we really need to use all these because of data gaps for a comprehensive health hazard evaluation. And I just want to mention, you know, here's the health hazard endpoints. You've all seen these before. These are listed from uh, the 2012 OSHA HASCOM standard and GHS fifth edition, uh, which just came out in 2013. And, and then our third step is we, if we have data gaps, we try to fill those data gaps. And this often requires experience and professional judgment. Um, we, as I said in the previous slide, we revisit the literature search strategy. We look at primary literature, see if we have any updated information in the primary literature, updated databases, et cetera. But a lot of times we're left with the, um, the option of doing um, the read across approach, which has really been brought to the forefront because of the REACH regulation and uh, QSAR, uh, Quality Structure Activity Relationships. And uh, the QSARs often involve computer modeling and those are called in silico approaches. 
and they often require specialized training, specialized equipment and software and computers and knowledge. Uh, but what I'd like to talk about just for, um, in, for practical application is the read across and have you a little more familiar with that. There are two types of read across. The first is the analog approach. And this is used for data gap filling when endpoint information from one chemical called a source chemical is used to predict the same endpoint for another chemical, which is called a target chemical, a chemical of interest. And we look at um, these relationships as, as per their mode of action in toxicokinetics or metabolism, et cetera. And this assessment may be qualitative or quantitative. And just showing you in, you know, in a couple of, uh, in a words there, we take the source chemical, the data, and we apply it to the target chemical to fill the data gaps. For read across for the category approach, we're essentially doing the same thing, but we look at substances who've, whose physical, chemical, or tox and ecotox properties are likely to be similar or follow a regular pattern as a result of some sort of structural similarity. And we look at these as a group. And so we obviously have to have a group of chemicals and the very common similarity is we look at a common functional group. You may be familiar with the isocyanate functional group, the N double bond, C double bond O. If we see that in a group of chemicals and we have a chemical for an alternative that has that, we may apply this read across approach and say it may have uh, the same hazard endpoints as uh, other isocyanates do. So uh, we would do that. So we use read across quite a bit. And then very, very important, we document and use the health hazard, hazard assessment. And um, here at 3M, one way that we do it, we do it multiple ways, but one way I wanted to mention is we, we develop what's called a health hazard profile or an HHP. And this is a comprehensive document for chemical, for a chemical for all endpoints. It's peer reviewed by at least two other toxicologists in our group in our medical department. And the results with interpretation, of course, we just don't throw out the results. We, we uh, supply it with interpretation and in our, our opinion. We use it to update HASCOM documents like safety data sheets, labels, regulatory classification of chemicals, which is you know, absolutely very important. And we use it in product development for safer alternatives. We do this on a daily basis. Um, and results are also used as a starting point for toxicologists to do um, risk or safety uh, assessments, whatever you'd like to call that. This is an example, hopefully you can see it. This is a, uh, a snippet from an HHP, and you can see we have endpoint route, we have uh, 3M hazard code and GHS classification, test qualifier, test result, endpoint summary, species, and duration. And this again looks very much like Cal presented for, um, in one of her slides, I believe it was slide 12, uh, when she talked about low Ls and no Ls and things like that. And this is this is what we finally end up with in, um, in corporate toxicology at 3M. For a lot of our base chemicals, we have hundreds of these that are, have been prepared by our toxicology staff over the years, and they're updated on a regular basis. Um, again, 12 principles of green chemistry. I just wanted to end with this slide. Well, I have one more slide, actually. and. Um, this slide is just some examples, and this is courtesy of Keith Miller from 3M Sustainability, of 3M products designed based on green chemi chemistry principles. And um, as you can see, the um, greener post-it notes, fast-tracked adhesive, greener magic tape, uh, the cleaner, uh, greener scotch Bright, and these 3M Envision products. And um, you can see in the red, it gives you what principle um, that that green chemistry uh, is applied to, and three is less hazardous chemical syntheses, number five, safer solvents, and number seven, use of uh, renewable feedstocks. And you see uh, a number of these products fall into a number of those categories. And with that, Hello? <laughs> Okay. Okay, thank you. Bye. Sorry, Rob. No, that's quite all right. I believe that was my last slide. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you, all three speakers. Um, if you have any questions, please type them into the question and answer box now. So we have one question. Adverse versus non-adverse effects. Are there examples mm -hmm. of irreversible changes that are not adverse effects? I'm sorry? Are there examples of irreversible changes that are not adverse effects? An example was provided, endocrine or reproductive effects such as changes 
in organs that don't affect reproductive success? Litter size? Yeah, there, there can be. I mean, it, it's very hard. That's a very hard question. It's a case by case and to see what kind of data we have. But, um, you know, you can have what we try to what strive for is our, as our point of departure generally as what we, you know, the no observed adverse effect level. And so you can have effects. You could have like changes. You could have irritation changes or you could have changes in enzyme levels and things like that, which using that guidance and using professional judgment, then on a case by case basis, you can have an effect, but not consider it to be adverse. So it, it, it's it's kind of a difficult question to ask in generalities. You have to look at it, you know, based on the data that are available. Great. Um, question also for Rob. Can you provide an example of an alternative assessment that you conducted with 3M? <laughs> uh, I don't think I can provide exactly. I mean, but quite honestly, we do this on, on a daily basis if, you know, if not, you know, a couple of times a week over the course, we, we don't go through the, the process like the, the green screen chemical hazard assessment or, or to the extent that uh, Cal showed with the DFE alternatives assessment and everything. What we generally do is we go, kind of an example would be a division. We, we at toxicologists, we support div different divisions here at 3M. And, you know, over the course of the years, what we would get is, you know, they would, the, the, the liaison with the division would contact us and say, our product developer has these three chemical alternatives that could be used in, um, you know, this product. Can you tell me about it? And it's, it's that open-ended of a question. And then we go through this exact process that I showed you, you know, with a little more detail, obviously. And then we don't go through, like I said, we don't use any specific green screen or DFE or anything like that, but we use the same principles that are involved in those um, alternatives assessment documents, then provide an answer back and try to put it into context not only of the hazard and the trade-offs with the hazard, like I mentioned, that we said, well, you, this, the first one was a carcinogen, but if we don't use that one, but this one is a reproductive developmental. You know, we try not to have those in there at all. But I'm just giving some, you know, some examples. So then we try to put it in the perspective of um, the risk-based equation of hazard is, is our risk equals hazard and uh, exposure. So, but for chemicals, I mean, for um, uh, not a particular chemical, I don't have one right at the right at hand of you know different chemicals. Okay. Uh, right. This is Cal, and I'd like to jump in to kind of um, uh, provide some support. Um, to that answer because in our safer products labeling program where we're looking at chemicals in products, if a product is submitted and the chemical and a chemical doesn't it fails to meet our criteria, we're constantly looking at what are the alternatives and lining them up in this kind of mini alternatives assessment framework, so not, we don't turn it into a big alternatives assessment, but it's like what are the alternatives, how do they compare, what are the trade-offs that might be associated with some of the alternatives and what makes sense? Because it, it, it isn't easy it, to find substitutes that are, um, that are functional and clearly safer. So often you're balancing all, all the different uh, trade-offs, and you, you can do this pretty quickly um, as you build a database of chemicals in your library. Great. Um, this is a question that's for all the panelists, and um, if you want to have some final comments too. To what degree and how is can toxicological information more effectively be integrated into chemical design? Well, this, this is Rob. I mean, I, I think very simply exactly what we've been talking about today. You have to take it, the hazard identification, hazard evaluation is an absolute integral part of safer alternatives, and that's the starting point. And the better the data, the better interpretation and, you know, logical, defensible interpretation of those data, the better you are going to be for safer alternatives. You don't want, as I said in one of my previous slides, you don't want to just go and say, okay, we changed this chemical out for this one. But this new chemical has its own set of, you know, hazard endpoints. All chemicals do, but it depends on the exposure. So I think, you know, using that general framework that you find in the, the DFE alternatives assessment criteria and the green screen and what we've been talking about today, 
is absolutely critical. And there's a wealth of data out there for a vast majority of chemicals if you're willing to dig for it, especially with that ECHA database now and some other things that are available, TOSCATs. This is Cal, and, and I would add to that, I, I agree with everything Rob said. I would add, though, that the more we know about the relationship between chemical structure and its biological activity, the more we can convert that into chemical design. So if we know a certain chemical structure is associated with a certain uh, type of developmental toxicity, we can avoid that chemical structure. But there's still a lot to, you know, we know a lot about certain biological activities, but there's still a lot to learn. And I think that this is a really vibrant area of research. And the green chemists are talking to toxicologists, and that's a good thing. This is Steve Gilbert. I, I think one of the important things is transparency. I think we need to know more about what chemicals are being used, how much are being used, and what processes these chemicals are used in. So that way, more of the stakeholders can participate in assessing the hazard and also potentially looking for alternatives to chemical use. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for attending. We've had about 100 attendees. And I just wanted to let you know about the next two upcoming webinars through the education series that are being planned for March and April. One is about how designers and chemists think about product development, and the other is Green Chemistry 101. The dates are to be determined as we're currently lining up speakers. Thanks again to Steve, Cal, and Rob for your wonderful presentations. And for those of you who are on the call that are not members of GC3, we encourage you to join and join the very vibrant network of firms across sectors and supply chains really trying to move these concepts that we're presenting. The slides will be available for everybody, and the recordings will be available to GC3 members. Um, thank you for attending, and we look forward to your participation in future calls. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.